I see. <laughs> well, maybe you just covered it up so well we didn't, we didn't know these things. Okay, so I've got some different things I want to cover today. And we're going to have a history lesson. And it's going to start in the beginning and go as long as I can keep talking, I guess. Uh, I have too many things here. On our, I have the, Jeannie and I have the privilege on Tuesday evening of having two of our grandchildren and, and our daughter come up and, and share uh, a meal together every Tuesday and then we study the Word of God. And we're studying this book, it's called what, what on Earth is God Doing? And the subtitle is Satan's Conflict with God. It's done by Renaud Showers. So that's the book we're going to be looking at information out of today. And uh, some of it I'm just going to give you some talk on, and some of it I'm going to just, he can say it better than I could, so I'll just read some of the uh, portions of the book today. So I've t the title of today's message is Satan's Conflict with God. So I put the onus on Satan as to what he and do what he's doing and why he did it and all of that good stuff. So, uh, in the beginning, of course, God was in heaven and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and they created angels. Uh, we'll cover when that happened a little bit later, but the essence of it is, is they there were three main angels that he created, just like an, an army, He's the commander in chief, and he has different branches of the military that he had, and it appears that they had three main branches uh, of, of, of angels. And so he, the one angel that the Bible refers to is Michael and his angels, and they seem to be warriors, uh, or maybe you could refer to them as the heavenly uh, guards. And uh, so that was their purpose. The next is Gabriel and his angels, and they seem to be messengers. So God used them to communicate from time to time with mankind, you know, so, so to send a message just to this and that and the other. And then in Isaiah 14, 12, Satan is referred to as Lucifer, and he and his angels seem to be musicians or the heavenly choirs and, and uh, the worship leaders for the heavenly hosts. And uh, some believe the name Lucifer, it only appears one time that I could find in the Bible, and some believe that that was Satan's name before he fell and was cast to earth. And then he came known by uh, multiple other names of which I will get to here in a little bit. So the question came to me is, when were angels created? And uh, the answer is, we don't really know. Uh, the Bible doesn't say specifically on such and such a date, I created this one, this one, and this one. So uh, as, as mankind is prone to do, when the Bible doesn't speak of something in particular, mankind will conjure up an answer for it. So that's... Basically, what uh, in my studies, it says some believe that they were created along with all the other things during the six days of creation. Others believe they were created long before God created uh, the heavens and the earth because he used, he, he is the purpose of the angels is to serve God. So you can just adjust that for however you think would be realistic. It says, why did God cast Satan out of heaven? The quick answer is pride. Uh, turn to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, 
and everybody knows exactly where that one is. Uh, it's just before Daniel and after Jeremiah. So still searching. And chapter 28, starting in verse 15. And this is the description of why Satan is cast from heaven. And it says, You were blameless in your ways from the days of when you were created, thick till wickedness was found in you. So you, your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, O guardian cherubim, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle, spectacle of you before kings. Will you come? Will you do me a favor and mm -hmm. put that light switch on? It's dark up here for Dennis. <coughs> there, there is me. It's up on the paper. <laughs> okay, so uh, briefly in Revelations chapter 12, it says the great Satan was hurled down, that ancient serpent and here's several names for him, uh, called the devil or Satan, who led the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And then in Revelation 12, 4, it states that his tail, being Satan's tail, swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. And it is believed that the word that is used in the Bible for stars is actually angels. So he was thrown to earth because of his pride and he took, they took a one third of the angels with him. So some other names for Satan. In Matthew he is called the tempter. Again in Matthew he is Beelzebub or Beelzebul. In John he is called ruler or prince of this world. In 2 Corinthians, he is called God of this world. In 1 John, he is called the evil one. And in Revelations, he is called, in Hebrew, Abaddon, but in Greek, he is called Apollyon. Apol and both of those, the meaning of those words is angel of bottomless pit. And we do know from scripture that he is going to end up in the bottomless pit. So when did God cast Satan out of heaven into the earth? That's the, my next question. Uh, we are not told when exactly. Some believe time, that was sometime during the creation period. Others believe after the creation. And for, to support those who believe in the after creation uh, time, if you read Genesis 1 and 30, 31, it said, God saw that he had made, he saw what he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished his work and he had done, and had been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. So the, those who believe that Satan is cast down after the creation, uh, based on this passage is that after Satan was rebelled and was cast down, all things or everything was not so good. So. You can take your pick, whatever you think on that. So we have Satan, he's been cast out of heaven. And to just say it mildly, 
he was a little upset. I suspect he was very angry and he wanted to wage war against God because he was, felt he wanted to be God himself, so he was going to work at trying to overtake God and, and take over the rule of heaven. So Satan started his attack, attack against God, and at this point, this is when the conflict between God and Satan begins. If you look in Genesis, once you turn near Genesis 3, verse 1. So now the serpent, this is Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from the, any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of the eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So that's the first attack Satan made on God's creation. He's, he, he couldn't stay in heaven, so he chose to corrupt God's creation. So mankind fell from grace and was now living in sin on the face of the earth because, of course, God cannot look upon sin. So God countered Satan with this uh, plan that he had. He said God, at some point in time, knew that he there would be needed a redeemer and so that mankind can come to God once again. So, as we see in the Bible, uh, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That was the ultimate sacrifice that God made for us. And so then, the, uh, the battle here is raging on, and God has countered Satan with a redeemer and as a way to return back and be righteous before God. In Genesis 3.15, he puts the plan in fact, and, you know, basically I think what he's saying here is he's informing Satan that his end is imminent. Because in Genesis 3.15, he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And of course, we know that as a messianic prophecy, a foretelling of the time when Jesus would be crucified, but would be raised again on the third day. So, knowing this now, Satan now knows that God has a plan for the redemption of mankind. So Satan's plan against God now goes that Satan will attack all of mankind. So he takes... And he starts with Cain and Abel, and he, you know the story of Cain and conflict and all that, but it starts with the, the committing of sin of murder. And that first act uh, brought Cain into uh, against, defiling against God, I, I guess was one way to put it. But that continued because the, his line, the Canaanites, were very violent, very anti-God, and very evil throughout the history of the world. And then it says that they became so perverted, the whole earth was filled with violence and corruption. So he did Satan's attack on one person 
and their lineage created much chaos in the earth. So then God's counterattack, it says through the bloodline of Seth, which is the son that came after Abel had been killed, Seth, God raised up, and he, in his bloodline, eventually became Noah. And we know that the world from Cain and Abel to Noah's time had become very corrupt. Uh, homosexuality ran rampant. Uh, Satan's angels, it is believed, came to heaven, or came from heaven to earth and, and married the daughters of men. And they had a whole new line of creatures walking on the face of the earth. Um, talk unto itself. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that. So anyway, so God then raises up Noah and his eight children, or ch his children, daughters, sons, and their, and their wives. And they started over and repopulated the earth. And it's an assumption on my part that they were righteous and godly people when they started. But as time went on, population grew. Why? There many more people came upon the earth. And that gave opportunity for Satan to strike back against God. And it says, in this t in time, all of the people on the earth gathered together to build a great city. So what happened there? The descendants of Noah had multiplied and gotten a large number of people. God instructed them to disperse around the world and fill the earth. But they were so comfortable, they stayed in one spot. They all settled in the valley of Sinar, I believe it's called. And there, they came up with the concept that maybe we can build a great tower that goes up into the sky and we can be like gods or like God when we build this tower. So, so that created then, it's called the Tower of Babel, of course, and then that was not obviously acceptable to God. So this is when they spread their uh, language. Let me read a little uh, information on, on this portion. It says, though time Noah's descendants began to suppress the truth about God, they refused to teach succeeding generations about him, and they rejected the truth concerning God revealing through nature. They boasted that they were wise and doing this, and their denial of God's truth made it appear that God is sovereign, or man is sovereign. Man's willful apostasy produced two tragic results. First, man invented several idolatrous religions as substitutes for worship of the true God. And second, man degenerated progressively into moral perversion. He gave free reign to vile passions and approved of gross displays of depravity. Thus, false religions and the most perverted form of depravity developed as a result of Satan's war against the kingdom of God. So that got pretty, pretty ugly in the uh, story of, of the conflict between God and Satan. So we have now the Tower of Babel. Uh, so God's next move to counter Satan is that God confused men's languages and dispersed them around the world. And through these new languages that came about, it also created the concept or the actual thing of nations. So this is where the origin of different nations begins. 
also in doing that, God also called a man by the name of Abram. And he called him out to be the father of the bloodline that would ultimately produce the Redeemer. So Satan at this point had failed to stop the progress of the Redeemer or coming to earth. Uh, so then we have the story of the Israelites uh, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you know, we all know the story. And they went to Egypt there 400 years, 300 years, three or four. What's that? Four. Okay. Long time. The people who left Egypt did not know how they got there. It was 400 years. So, uh, so then we now have the Israelites leaving uh, the Egypt and some of them were real happy about that, some of them were not so happy about that. But it's kind of interesting as you read through Genesis that how quickly they did complain about Moses taking them into the desert. Because uh, I got to thinking about that, that the, the slaves who made the bricks and worked in the fields in Egypt were probably glad to get out of there. The slaves that worked in people's homes and you know, did their served them, they probably weren't so happy because they probably had a pretty good life when they were in Egypt. So half of them were happy, half of them were not. But anyway, they had not been in contact or having a close relationship with God while they were in the nation of Egypt. So uh, while they were in the desert, it says here, because the Israelites' special relationship to God, it was essential that she have a place to worship Him, and that He have a place to dwell in a special sense in their midst. To this end, God revealed to Moses plans for a portable worship dwelling structure called the tabernacle. Once the tabernacle was built and erected, the glory of the God, of glory of God filled it as a sign of God's protective presence with his people. So they're free now. God is living with his people, and all is good, at least for the Israelites, because you know, since the Tower of Babel, the overall name called Gentiles were dispersed around the world. So now as we go through history, it now starts focusing on the Israelites and their program of being God's representative on this earth that through the blessings that God gave his people, the Gentiles could see who God truly was. So that was working fairly well. But then Satan, of course, has to intervene and stir up trouble again. So through this process of going in the desert, why they came close to Canaan. And Moses picked out 12 men to go into the land. They called them spies. And to spy out the land to see what it was like, how the best way to get in the land would be, and just the, the military reconnaissance of see how you would plan a future battle with them. So they went in, they did their thing, they came back out, and through Satan's influence, uh, only, or only two men says, we can do this. 10 others says, it's too difficult, the people are too uh, strongly armed, it's just too heavy a military force for us to take the land. So, what did God do? He adjusted his plan, and just as an 
I guess a punishment for those because of lack of faith. God made them remain in the desert for 40 years. And until all of those who were present uh, during a time period that they did not have faith and, and entered the land when God was ready for them to do so, why they had all passed away. So then we have, it says, when the 40 years of wandering were nearly ended, Moses prepared a new generation of Israelites for the conquest of Canaan. He warned Israel to destroy the people living in Canaan. These, these idolatrous people had become so perverted that their cup of iniquity was full and ripe for judgment. They were to be destroyed so that Satan could not be, uh, could not use them to drag the Israelites into such gross apostasy and perversion as to make Israel's total destruction necessary. In other words, the coming of the Redeemer was more essential for the benefit of mankind than the continuation existence of a deprived people of Canaan. So he, uh, and as we know, they didn't do it. They left some, they let some live. And as we know in the book, the result of that was there was not, there was distraction in the land. So from this time on, we go, they did enter the land, uh, went through a long period of history of obviously conflict between Satan and God, uh, you know, between nations, they had wars, and you know, mankind and his sin nature went through uh, normal life. And Till then, Satan had a new plan. Remembering that his original goal was stop, to stop the Redeemer from ever coming to earth. So the people complained to God. They had all these judges, and they had good judges, and they had bad judges. And so then the people wanted a king. So that brings up the next. Uh, issue that we have is that God did appoint a king for the Israelites. And so they, they chose, not God's choice, but they chose Saul. And this portion says Satan had a purpose for promoting Israel to ask for a king. While Israel had been without a general central government, it had found it impossible to get the whole nation to go apostate to one at one time. Now that Israel had a king, a central government would be formed. This situation would provide a better opportunity for perverting per, per, per the entire nation at once. For the king would go apostate, surely the nation would also follow. So, and he did. Satan did, or Saul did fall away from God, and he uh, was rewarded by being killed in battle. But then God had a plan to raise up David as king of Israel. David was a godly man and served the Lord well. He had a son called, named Solomon. In the, begin, in the beginning, he was a godly man. But eventually through uh, time, he also became apostate from God. But in the meantime, while Solomon was doing well, he built a temple, he glorified God, and they returned worship to God back into the temple. Uh, 
why Satan had another move to counter that. So Satan caused Solomon to turn away from God and he became apostate. It says, while Satan was working to, to prevent the Redeemer from coming by pushing Judah deeper into apostasy, he also worked to accomplish the same goal by trying, by trying to annihilate the royal line of David. His instrument of attack was um, Athaliah, Athaliah, daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. The notorious duo of the northern kingdom, Eliab, married into the royal house of Judah. After her husband and son died, she seized the throne of Judah and made herself queen. To secure her position as ruler, she ordered the extermination of every royal person descended from David. Another attempt to annihilate the Redeemer. God countered this satanic attempt to destroy the line of the Redeemer by preserving one of David's royal descendants, the infant Joash. He was hidden in the temple for six years by the high priest and his wife. At the right time, Joash was crowned king and Adaliah was slain. The next king that came was Hezekiah, <clears throat> which appears to be a godly man for a period of time. And then <coughs> the, the, then the apostasy returned to Israel and it reached its lowest point during the reign of Manasseh, Judah's most wicked king. Manasseh led his kingdom into more perverted practices than those of the Canaanites. The apostasy of his reign became so gross that God's judgment on Judah was made irrevocable. So between the northern tribes becoming perverted and being hauled off to Babylon by the Assyrians, now Judah had become perverted, so they were carried off to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. So now we have the, the time of, so God destroyed Israel and gave them over to the Assyrians who carried off to Persia. Uh, then Satan turned his kingdom over to Judah, which I just read to you in, the, in this book here. <clears throat> so then the Jews, Jewish people were packed off to Babylon and they were there for, I believe, 70 years. It says, once the Jewish people were captive in Babylon, Satan attacked again. Nebuchadnezzar decreed that all <coughs> his subjects should worship an image of himself. Jewish obedience to his decree would have involved God's people in apostasy once again. God countered this satanic move by miraculously preserving through their punishment the first Israelites who refused to obey the king's decree. As a result, the Jewish people were released from any obligation to worship any, anyone except for God. So I, I believe that, that uh, preserving at that point in time was from Hadassah, is that correct? Esther, mm -hmm. uh, that they did this decree that all the Jews were going to be killed in this nation. And through Esther, letting the king know that this plot, plot was going on, why they were able to let all the Jews in 
in Babylon know that this was coming so they could prepare for it and defend themselves. So Satan once again tried to annihilate the people who were going to bring on the Redeemer. So then they have goes on at the end of the 70 years about seven about 50,000 Israelites returned to Jerusalem, <coughs> rebuilt the temple, and they went back to uh, worshiping God and growing through this process. Then the, the Greeks uh, took over the, the, the countryside and they came into Israel and ruled it over Israel uh, and then they were so perverted that they tried to stamp out all worship of God. They defiled the, the temple and wanted the, all of the Jews to worship the idols that he brought in. And then a group of Israelites rose up against him, overthrew him, I believe the name of him was Maccabees, and they then recaptured the temple, reinitiated the uh, holy sacrifices and the worship of God, and that's where we come up with Hanukkah from that, from that experience there. Then the Romans came in, they threw out the, the Greeks, and they took over the rule of, of uh, Israel, and that is where we get comes into the picture of King Herod. It's the Romans appointed him as king over uh, Israel to administer the, the country for Rome. And so now we're real close to the Redeemer getting here. We are. Uh, Mary's been notified that she's going to give birth to the Redeemer. Satan is just about defeated. He said his wits end. He's he can see he's losing the battle, and so the uh, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, where the prophecy said that he would be born, and so Satan had one last chance to to prevent the Redeemer from coming into the world, and that we see in Matthew two. It says then Herod, when he had saw that he was deceived by the wise men, he, ex he was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all of the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So Satan and of God, of course, as we know, God had informed Joseph to leave Bethlehem, escape into Egypt to preserve Jesus' life, and in the ultimate, Satan was defeated. So there we have the history of the conflict, conflict between Satan and God, and we are so thankful that he was not. So. That concludes this portion of the service. Now, we have a little guess, house cleaning to say, I'm not sure. You know, as they, as they say, uh, in families, usually family members talk to each other and they uh, stay up to know what's going on in the family and so that uh, they can all work to help each other uh, and just act as a family to for everyone's best interests. <laughs>